Hi everyone, Peter here from Flow High Performance, and in this video we will cover how the biarticular muscle theory influences hypertrophy training. First, let's explore the claim that squats don't train the hamstrings muscles. This study explored the effects of squat training to different depths on lower body muscle hypertrophy. While the researchers found that deep squats produce greater increases in muscle growth for the quads, glutes, and adductors, we are interested in what effect squats had on the hamstrings. As we can see in this graph, neither squat variation resulted in significant growth of the hamstrings muscles. Throughout the rest of this video, we will explore the biarticular muscle theory, which should explain why squats don't train the hamstrings very well, and how this applies to other muscle groups too. So first we need to explore what exactly biarticular muscles are. A biarticular muscle is one which acts on two or more joints, based on its anatomical structure. This means it acts to produce movement at more than one joint. Since we have already discussed the hamstrings, let's use this as an example to demonstrate this idea. There are four hamstrings muscles, the biceps femoris longhead, the biceps femoris shorthead, the semitendinosus, and the semimembranosus. All of these hamstrings muscles are biarticular, except for the biceps femoris shorthead, which we don't need to worry about for this example. So the other three hamstrings muscles originate on the pelvis and insert on either the tibia or fibula. So as we can see, they cross both the hip joint and the knee joint, and therefore act to produce movement at both joints. Therefore, they are considered biarticular. At the hip, the primary role of the hamstrings is hip extension. So if we are bent forward at the hip, the hamstrings would act to straighten the body back up, as we would see during a hip thrust or a stiff leg deadlift. At the knee joint, the hamstrings primarily act to flex the knee. This means bending the knee joint to move the heel towards the back of the leg, like you would see during a leg curl exercise. The hamstrings are one example of a biarticular muscle, although there are many others in the human body too. So now that we have established what a biarticular muscle is, let's explore the biarticular muscle theory and how it relates to hypertrophy training. The biarticular muscle theory essentially suggests that a biarticular muscle will have limited involvement in movements when the movement requires two opposing actions from that muscle. This sounds quite confusing, so we will use an example to demonstrate this idea. Let's go back to our initial example of the hamstrings during squats. A squat involves simultaneous hip extension and knee extension. So when we stand up from a squat, the hips extend and the knee extends to straighten our legs. As we established, the hamstrings contribute to both hip extension and knee flexion. So during squats, the hamstrings would be able to contribute to hip extension. However, they don't contribute to knee extension. This is because the hamstrings flex the knee, not extend the knee. So as we can see, the hamstrings shorten at the hip, but lengthen at the knee during a squat, which means they won't contribute much to that movement. So now we have explored the biarticular muscle theory, let's now discuss what implications this has for hypertrophy training. We have explored one example of how squats don't train the hamstrings, however there are also other biarticular muscles in the body. There are five primary biarticular muscles which are relevant for trainees aiming to maximize muscle growth. These are the gastrocnemius, hamstrings group excluding the biceps femoris shorthead, the rectus femoris, biceps brachii, and the long head of the triceps. There are other biarticular muscles in the body too, but it is only really these five which are relevant for hypertrophy training because they are large and superficial muscles. This means they will contribute to aesthetic appearance, while smaller muscles situated underneath the superficial muscles aren't really seen on the surface of the body. These specific biarticular muscles may need specific consideration when being trained. While we won't go through exactly how the biarticular muscle theory relates to each of these muscles, we will explain the general considerations that should be made to maximize muscle growth. The first and primary consideration that should be made is exercise selection. We may think that these muscle groups are being trained, but because they are biarticular, they may not be maximally recruited with the exercises we are implementing. So we need to ensure that the muscle is being trained properly, and if not, we may need to modify exercise selection to ensure we are maximizing growth. This may require additional isolation lifts to be performed to ensure we are training the particular muscle group. For example, let's look at the biceps during pulling movements. Both heads of the biceps originate on the scapula and insert on the radius. 
This means they contribute to both elbow flexion and shoulder flexion. During pulling exercises, we have elbow flexion, which the biceps can contribute to, but we also have shoulder extension, which is an opposing action to what the biceps can contribute to. So the biceps shorten at the elbow joint, but lengthen at the shoulder joint, meaning they won't contribute much to pulling exercises. Therefore, back training alone is probably not sufficient to maximize biceps growth. Trainees should therefore include some isolated bicep curls to maximize their growth. And the second implication that the biarticular muscle theory has is for lifting technique. Trainees should ensure when training a biarticular muscle that technique maximizes recruitment of that muscle. Certain deviations in form may limit the involvement of a biarticular muscle and result in an inferior hypertrophy stimulus. This is specific to each lift and each muscle group, but we will now cover one example to demonstrate this idea. Let's take the cable tricep pushdowns as an example. The long head of the triceps is a biarticular muscle since it originates on the scapula and inserts on the ulna. This means it contributes to elbow extension, just like the other two tricep heads, but also contributes to shoulder extension. Shoulder extension is when the arm is brought down and back from when it is in front of the body. So when we perform the tricep extensions, we want to avoid any shoulder flexion during the concentric portion of the exercise. This is because shoulder flexion is an opposing movement of the long head of the triceps. If the shoulder flexes while the elbow extends, the long head of the triceps won't be maximally recruited and won't receive much of a muscle growth stimulus. This won't affect the other two heads of the triceps, but the long head won't be maximally recruited. In practice, this means we should avoid turning our pushdowns into pressing movements, which sometimes happens as the trainee gets fatigued towards the end of a set. Rather, we should lock the elbows by the side of the body, focusing purely on elbow extension. Each biarticular muscle should be carefully considered when being trained to ensure our technique is maximally effective. Thanks for watching and hopefully you got something out of this video. Remember to subscribe if you haven't already.